Hey guys, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming to our wedding reception where it seems like I'm giving more of a best man speech. Um, I will not be too long, which is good, but I'm here to introduce the guys today. And we're here to talk about inventing the medium and how to actually deal with emerging technology, which has been a pain in the ass ever since the first Smelly Creative actually found a way to use technology to extend their voice beyond the grave. And every creative that's followed, from storytellers, sculptors, painters, have always struggled before they have succeeded with this problem of how do I use new technology to extend the, or communicate the human experience. We've always had this, and that whole relationship has always been fascinating, how technology inspires our artists, and then art goes on to inspire new technologies, and the relationship has always gone on to kind of open new ways and windows to see the world. From the, print, ugh, from the printing press, how we got novels and had the ability to share stories across the world, to photography and cinema, where we could capture movement and reality more obviously, and now today, where we uh, have computers and the power of interactiv interactivity. Which, I guess our major point today is that it's this power of interactivity that most of us as creatives are actually ignoring. Like it's so, creates, computers and interactivity are so far from our creative psyche or what we're used to that we've spent the last 30 years of it kind of using it to improve old mediums. We make movies with computers. We write books with computers. We even paint with computers. It's only really the games industry that who was born from using the computer itself as a medium of expression that can claim to have explored the language of interactivity to any great depth at all. And we, as creatives, are all the more poorer for not taking part ourselves. Because most of our crafts have been about learning to speak to audiences or speak at them, when we actually now have the kind of power to speak with them. The same way you learn more from a single conversation with a great teacher than you would from any textbook is the same way that interacting with an experience can actually enhance our capacity to understand. When an experience makes you personally part of it and lets you see the world from different perspectives, when it presents you with different options um, and choices and makes you witness those consequences, then what else does it do? <laughs> um, then again, when it lets you replay that experience and ask how may things be different, these are all things that create, let us create works that are much closer to our own world, worlds that can go more than one way, and it kind of changes our relationship from storytellers to story makers. But it's, not e it's really easy to see why we've kind of shied away from really exploring new technology and interactivity in, in itself. Because where we've had hundreds of years to learn how to use a paintbrush properly, technology today just freaking changes every five minutes. This is a chart of S1T2 struggle to keep up over our short existence. These are all the different technologies we've learned year on year um, through actual projects to kind of explore different ways to tell stories. And some of these have felt like trying to finger plate with your own blood, which is terrible. They all have their own problems, platforms, and things like that. But that's not the problem. That's not why we're ignoring them. Creatives, we're pretty brave. I think the big problem here is that the one thing they all have in common is that they're new. And when something's new, it's much easier to see the gimmick than it is the greatness. VR is a great example of this. This is not why VR is, should be important. This is. This is the work of Dr. Miguel Nicolas. Now, his patients are paraplegics. They have no feeling or movement in their legs whatsoever. But what he's done through an interactive experience is use virtual reality where they use their mind to walk around a virtual space. And that has actually retrained undamaged nerve cells to their legs, which has given them some the ability to feel movement again, not feel movement, some the ability to feel again and limited basic movement. It's quite hard to overemphasize what kind of has happened here. Just through an interactive experience, he has changed physiologically his patients. A make-believe world has actually changed the real world. And that's the lesson here, or the most important point, is we can't afford to ignore these new mediums or their instruments until we've tried to push them towards our own creative purpose, because you don't know how, more, how powerful they could be. It's our jobs as creatives to kind of pick up these instruments, test them, share what sounds good, tune them together so we can make kick-ass music. And that's kind of what today's about just hearing how these creatives have gone about making things with technologies they didn't understand, but somehow are still able to tell the story of Alzheimer's across four different countries in interactive sculptures, help commit over $400 million in funding using immersive worlds to conflict-affected regions. And today, you guys will all see on the main stage how they use the leotard of the future to remix Adobe's logo. Jack, Inga, Nikki, and Liam are great creatives in their own right. How they've jumped between mediums is their story. 
but it's more important how they learnt and worked together in their larger creative teams and communities that's fast-tracked S1T2's development. So without further ado, I will give you Jack Condon. Jack, in any other life, would have probably been a bard or some opulent emperor, but in this one, he spent his time working in games, then he went to fine arts, then he went to academia, and now he's back again. He's been a practicing artist since 2011 with residencies in art, in art galleries across Mexico and Australia, and we first got the chance to work together on an Aboriginal Dreamtime experience, a VR one, a few years ago. Today, he leads up S1T2's real-time rendering team, and he, more than anyone here, actually believes in the power of interactive mechanics and gaming to do more than it actually has. And his message will be largely about how you guys can get involved in that. So please join me in welcoming Jack to the stage. Hey, Adobe Make It. My name's uh, Jack Condon, and um, I'm here to try to explain why you should use game development as a expressive medium. Um, so a bit about this talk. I guess I'm trying to find myself about four or five years ago, uh, a frustrated creative, kind of fed up with their medium and not sure which direction to go to. Um, so I'm going to be a bit uh, indulgent, going to step back into my past way too far. Um, I've kind of been in game development for a really long time, but starting anecdotally, this is kind of... I was very obsessed with mazes as a kid, and I think this is pretty relatable. Like, a lot of kids kind of draw shit in their A3 notepads. I used to fill up heaps of them. Um, and my mazes, it wasn't really important that they had an end. Um, they were kind of just about doing them, and that's the theme that's kind of stayed with my work. So in, in the end, I actually just stopped putting in exits to my mazes, and I just kept going. Um, but I was lucky enough. I got a computer when I was about seven. There I am. Um, from one of my dad's mates who was in IT. And I didn't, I didn't know what operating system it was working on. It was a very strange thing. But what I was interested in was the video games that it had pre-installed on it. Um, so Jill of the Jungle was my favorite game. I can still remember myself and my sister um, singing Coco Jumbo, Mr. President's song, uh, because we thought that was an appropriate artistic pairing to the two. Um, and, I, and I remember role-playing that strong Amazonian woman swinging from uh, vine to vine, and I knew that I wanted to be a game developer. Um, so I think it's a, it's a fairly typical story of a nerd after that. Um, you can see me with my Microsoft Sidewinder and my empty bowl of Pepsi and basically every moment that I had, I was working on my craft. Um, I started out with Microsoft Excel. That was my first gaming engine. So I was reprogramming its macros to try to make games out of that. Uh, eventually, my auntie's boyfriend at the time came over. He was a Microsoft developer, saw this absolutely horrified and gave me a copy of... Um, Visual Basic Studio, which came in like 20 CD-ROMs. Uh, and after that, I was uh, developing games in Windows Forms. So I don't know if you can imagine an OK button being chased by a cancel button and you were a cursor trying to you know, map through these Windows Forms. Uh, eventually, I found uh, web-based games. I was inspired by the likes of um, Utopia and I don't know if anyone can remember these Neopets and all these types. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I decided I was going to make one of these games. I was going to make Land Questar which was a terrible name, but I made it when I was about 11, so. <laughs> um, this project went on all the way till I was 18. Making this decision ultimately changed my life in a massive way, and not for the better. It wasn't till I was about 18 and I was old enough to look in retrospect about the experiences that I had um, as a game developer sitting there in front of a computer and realizing that I'd missed out on many experiences that a typical teenager should have. Um, I spent all my time in isolation, by myself, not working with anyone, obsessively trying to make this game. Uh, I realized something had to change. I haven't got a picture of Landquester today because my uh, ultimate resolve was to kill what I was obsessive about, so I deleted seven years of work. Uh, and I decided I needed to change. Um, so I had two passions at the time. I was either going to go to clowning school in New Zealand or I was going to art school. And uh, my parents were clever enough to kind of push me to the more kind of successful career I would think of attempting to be an artist. So uh, this is one of my works. Um, I went to art school. It was completely different from that isolation that I was experiencing. Um, obviously, you know, the first thing that you're doing is you're reading a lot of content from other people. It's one way of changing ideas, but you're also talking about those things with other people, um, sharing ideas. I, I was working in photo media, obviously, um, and uh, Probably the nicest thing about that was I was working with crews. 
Um, so it wasn't really just about the content, but socially it was carrying all this bunch of gears, jumping over fences we shouldn't have been in and taking pictures and things like this and eating pizza and drinking beer. But also, obviously, art school is a great uh, time to develop yourself conceptually. Um, this is another one of my works. I guess to put it simply, they're kind of like being hit by a semiotic truck. Um, just like, I, I, it was always my dream to try to make a, a picture that could never quite be read. So basically you would kind of stare at it and you would keep getting meaning or content from it until you eventually got too fatigued and walk away. So in this way it was completely like my mazes, but in, in the process of actually trying to move that information from you know, your, your sight to consciousness and process that in a way that made sense, but you were stuck in a maze that would never end. Um, clearly, Jeff Wall, Gregory Crutz and Steven Spielberg were big inspirations, but um, also I was inspired by a guy called Christoph Koch, who works a lot with trying to map consciousness, um, and he kind of, he does this through studies of the optical cortex, and one of his kind of ideas that I really attached to um, was the seven points of perception. So this is probably a theory that quite a lot of designers are aware of, but it's this principle that we only take in about seven things. Rather, our subconsciousness sees everything, but we only pass about seven points in your vision um, to our brain, because basically that's all our little internal CPU can handle. Um, and this is kind of how that like optical illusion works with the, um, the basketball players passing the ball, and then you look again and there's the gorilla walking through. Uh, that's, how, that's the principle of that. So I was kind of trying to play with these ideas um, by, you know, like, and various others with, within photography, like a very equal depth of field and a composition that doesn't put one item above the other. So to the effect, I was always hoping to generate an image where you would take seven, seven of these semiotics and kind of start processing them. And then before you could even finish that, you'd kind of already stumble across another seven. Um, I don't know how successful I was in the end. I was uh, working with this, this kind of, uh, these ideas for, for seven years with photo media. Um, but I do know that I kind of got to the end of that. I started to make work within photo media that was doing the same thing that I had done in the previous work. The levels of progression of the ideas that I wanted to explore became smaller and smaller and smaller and it became more and more frustrating. I didn't know where to go. Um, I don't think it's a surprise that I've ended up in real-time graphics because these kind of things that I'm, I'm interested in, overstimulation, um, the seven points of perception, they're things that as a game designer I have to deal with day in, day out. Um, I think VR is like the perfect example of this because you can't control where someone's looking at. And even still, games have to be built in a way that you need to build content. They are somewhat linear, even in an open world. It's very hard to tell them what's interactable and what's not. Um, so it's kind of did all the things that I was interested in in photo media inherently, kind of for free. Um, but that's probably not why I went back to them. Um, between when I was a teenager and now, there was kind of the rise of the indie movement. And what that was was a bunch of tiny studios because of the internet being able to publish. And I saw people making truly expressive works that AAA hadn't really explored yet. All of a sudden, real opinions were coming out through games that were otherwise clouded by either publishers, potentially, or too many people working on them, or whatnot. Um, and that was a really inspiring thing. So I thought, well, I'm stuck here. I've got to try something else. Um, so I'm going to share the story of, of my story of how I got into indie gaming, or gaming in general. Um, I didn't know how to do it. The only way I knew, I knew that I never wanted to do again. Um, so I, I had to solve that problem. I would say this is how you could make games. My journey isn't the best one anymore, but I don't know, maybe we can learn something from that. Uh, so making games can be like being in a high school punk band. And I guess what I mean by that, um, outside of the fact that we look like mean guys there, <laughs> uh, is, that, is that in high school you have all this time and no one knows who they are and everyone's trying to find themselves, I suppose. And inevitably, a group of people are going to get together and they're going to say, hey, we're going to be the cool guys or girls and we're going to make a rock band. Um, so what happens after this is people need to fill those instruments that need to be filled to make that band. So someone says, all right, I'll be the drummer. You've got the lead, lead guitarist, the lead singer who's the loudest of the bunch and maybe a keyboard player or something. Then they get together maybe once or twice a week and they're terrible. Even their parents will not lie about it. They're awful. But that's not the point. It's not the production that's important here. It's the fact that they're getting together and expressing themselves through the instruments that they're learning at the same time. 
There's no judgment there because they're all equally shit. They're just jamming. Right? Um, I, I think this is a really beautiful idea, and that's kind of what we did. We kind of met up at a pub one day, and we're like, shit, let's do this. Um, so we converted this garage into an office, and of course, we weren't um, high schoolers trying to find ourselves. We were guys in our mid-20s gaining fairly good beer guts and growing our beards really long, but the principles were more or less the same. So we got together and we started making a game called Aurora 17, uh, which was like this space survival game um, with a tagline, Solon from Thunderdome. Uh, it was something like, 14 people are trying to escape a dying ship, but there are only two escape pods, um, or something. Aurora 17 was a strange experiment. We ended up just calling it Space Game, because that was easier. And I, th I think that's, that's indicative, because we didn't really know what that project was. Um, it was just a group of guys coming together not knowing anything. It was a group of people without any desire to actually ship a product. It was our garage band. It was social, it was innovative, and it was exploring. But best of all, uh, meeting up once a week for 12 hours really changed our lives. What we had created without doing a pre-production process, or rather our pre-production process was, who wants to be a programmer? Who wants to be an artist? Was we created an environment where anything could be made. Anyone could come up with an idea and say, hey, I want to try this. And we'd be like, ah, let's spend four days developing that. Oh, wasn't any good. Delete it. Try again. Refractor. Rebuild. Reside. Like, just keep trying. We created a space where we could try out any game design, any art style, anything, iteratively and destroying it over and over again. The output wasn't important at all. Um, and what was interesting about this, it was very similar to a process-based art practice, which I was completely comfortable. So these kind of work habits um, transferred really well, despite not knowing the tools. However, we spent five years on this, and ultimately, as you would expect, a project like this totally flunked, um, burnt to the ground, and we drank it away. Uh, we, I didn't delete this one on the hard drive, though, so that's kind of nice. And I, this is one of the only pictures I have, though. Um, so how you should make a game. Um, during this process, we discovered something else. And it's something that converges that whole five years into a pressure cooker of 48 hours. Um, and that is the concept of a game jam. So what a game jam is, is it's a group of people who come together. Um, it could be virtual or it could be physical, but generally is a physical location. You may know no one there, you may only know very few people there, but you'll be put on a team. Um, from that point on, you'll go from a pre-production phase, a production phase to a release phase in 48 hours. Within 48 hours, you'll be staring at a video game you made. It doesn't matter if you don't have skills. A lot of people go to game jams just to experiment with their instruments. Um, they have, the, the, and you learn on the job. And people from the industry who have been there for years want to mix with these people. They want the ideas. They want the outsider kind of things. Because game jams, in essence, are um, completely anti-commercial. Um, someone asked me the other day if a game jam is essentially like a hackathon. And I had to think about it for a while because it's not. Hackathons, hackathons are there to solve a problem. They are a get together to actually solve one specific problem. A game jam doesn't solve a problem. It just asks questions and explores. And that's it. That's its only purpose. So it's an incredible space for people to get together and just make something. And it's non-competitive. It's just experimental. And I think the term game jam is not an accident. I think musicians are very lucky to have this word jamming, to go up to a jazz bar and meet people there with their sexy instruments and their Fender guitars and whatever. Uh, I don't think us gamers, we don't have the sexy Fenders. But you know, we, we, we can carry our big computers upstairs and plonk them on tables and we can get to work and make creative stuff together in the exact same way with the exact same sentiment. And that's what game jams have captured. Um, to give you a reference of how big this idea is, Global Game Jam produces, it's once a year, and thousands of teams globally enter that. And within that 48 hour window, thousands of games are generated. Another one that I put there is NSI Games. They're in North Sydney TAFE. They're local. Um, they do a game jam about once every three months. and as I said, if, if any of this is resonating with you, you do not need any skills. So I would encourage you to come, meet some people. Maybe we can end up making a game together. Um, so through this whole experience, um, all these kind of things I learned about gaming and relearned about gaming, of course, uh, I've, I've learned that through the game jams and everything, gaming is actually inherently social because it has to be collaborative. Um, and it is experimental, and it's extremely expressive. 
So what now? I, I kind of wanted to come back to my roots and see what would happen. Now I'm armed with this new medium that I feel confident with, come back into the gallery space. This is an artwork that me and Liam, who's going to be talking today, um, collaborated together. It's called Anti-Game. Um, and it was a maze. Uh, but it was finally the maze that I could never make as a kid. It was the maze that people actually couldn't escape. So they would put on these headsets and um, they were stuck in this kind of five by five room that would always be changing and they were stuck in this labyrinth where they, they could never ever escape it. In fact, there were only two ways to escape. You could either take off the headset and leave the gallery or you could step through the virtual walls cheating our maze and then um, we presented them a little door which would put them in a little white loading room until they eventually took off the headset and walked, <laughs> walked away. And it was really great to explore kind of ideas that I have wanted to explore for a long time with this new medium. I saw its power. But I've almost become more interested in the inverse. And that's studios these days making conceptual games, not for the gallery space, but rather for the platforms that games fully existed on first. I'm talking about platforms like Xbox, Steam, um, whatever, Nintendo. And that's now happening. Um, and it's happening at an increasing rate. Anyone who's working in games today is part of something bigger than just their game. They're part of an experience of redefining what that medium is. That medium is going under a lot of change and it has a lot of potential. So by being involved in games, you are always pushing the boundary of what gaming can be and it's extremely exciting and extremely rewarding. Um, and we're seeing this, for example, um, a lot of these studios, I can, I can name it through a few, but one of them in particular, a lot of these studios that are pushing the buck are coming from cross-disciplinary backgrounds. And what I mean by that is they didn't start in gaming. They went out and did a bunch of other things, and they've somehow fallen into it. Uh, I'm talking about studios like Us2, who were originally a design studio, but then went out on their own and took a risk and decided to make a game. They made the mobile game Monument Valley with their design sensibilities, and it changed the mobile gaming market forever. Um, there are way more studios doing this, but I think the one thing to keep in note is that gaming, to really extend itself and become what it can be, requires creators from dis different disciplines to extend it. Um, so when I'm talking to this room full of creators at Adobe Make It, I think this is a perfect time to say that this is a really good time to get involved in gaming because gaming needs people from different areas. Uh, and together, I would hope that we can push this medium to be as expressive and creative and experimental as it possibly can be. Thank you very much. <laughs>
but I try my best here. Um, but yeah, even though I'm born and raised in Thai and speak only Thai language for the 18 years of my life, I'm lucky enough to that my parents have cable TV and I still grew up with media, MTV, Cartoon Network. I, that's when I start to have obsession with movements and animation and also like all the media that I like is all like animated movies, cartoon, all the part that no one watched like in movies, like you know the title sequence at the beginning and the end, it's like it's a weird obsession, but that's my thing. Anyway, with all those things, that's when I start to have a think about how how they make it really, how how they make all the still image and moving and how the animation is moving, fascinating with all the movements. And that's when I start to have my little dream of becoming animator. And I did. I moved all the way to Australia and tried to follow my dream and become animator. But not with that haircut. But <laughs> bad. Apologize. Um, so I not only just to move to Australia is struggle because I have to learn the whole new language to communicate with normal people in Australia, but I also have to learn the different term of arts and animation and everything, right? So that's become like my double struggle of how to communicate with people in general and with the artists. But I got with a good old determination. I got pretty good at it. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, and when I mention good at it, I'm actually that good that I got selected to screen my animation in Acme in Melbourne. And the problem is, even though in my credit, I actually put my name as Tan Pichalada Ponvitaya. It's like a sentence. It's not even a word that people can call. So I literally just changed my name, just make up some name, and I named myself Nikki. And there's literally a story behind it. It'll probably take one hour to explain, but I will not do it now. But we can grab drink and explain it later. And um, as I changed my name to Nikki, then I started to look for a job. Moved from Sydney and Melbourne, and then I landed a job as animator, as I dream of, at S1T2. But working with S1T2 is slightly different and a little bit changing a bit of my dream. The reason why I say that, because I have a chance to work in so many cool projects, like in interactive, like sculpture at Vivid, in the piece that I work with is High Ray and Affinity at the top there and also maybe some like interactive game as well, like Energizer game that we actually create a big arcade game that take a motion sensor with the Kinect. And also the one I'm pretty proud of is actually the documentary in virtual reality with the World Bank. And the latest thing I actually create is actually hologram work with um, Air Force. And this year is Adobe Remix with the team. And even though I work with so many interactive stuff, so that's go back to why I work in so many interactive stuff and that's become struggle because, because I have to collaborate. Because before I start work with S1T2, I just solo animator. And all I do is actually I can do production from beginning to the end. I can create storyboard, create graphics, animating it and render it out by myself, right? But when you're working on interactive and immersive work, then you start to get introduced into collaboration with um, artists, engineer, or even like programmer. And for me, all I learned in uni, all my whole life, they moved to Australia, is actually speaking animator, like secondary movement, key frame, frame rate, and render it out. And all I need to talk at work now, I have to learn how, what user experiences and user interfaces, what code is, what game engine is. And that's very scary. And, but then, Journey in S1T2 actually created opportunity for me to found my own language to amplify my creativity through collaboration. By be it, do it, and visualize it. It's gonna get geeky, it's a lot of Star Wars reference, sorry. Um, so let's start with be it. And be it for me, you don't, have, you don't need to be it, be it. You have to sort of be it. And the reason why I picked this picture, you can see like a, that, I'm like that stormtrooper right there. Wait, what's the laser? That one with the bucket. That's me right there. So you sort of have to sort of be it, but not being it. And for me, the reason why I picked this picture because it's more an express of how you self taught yourself enough to understand others' role of the colleagues or the other people at work. So you don't need to be, like I don't need to be programmer, but at least I need to learn how to program a little bit or to do my part to be, to be able to understand, to communicate to them. And another sample I have is 
Actually, if anyone experienced going overseas and try to use Tinder, the best way is you probably score, you score better if you be able to understand what language to speak to them. That's so to apply to work, but not Tinder way, like language way. Um, so if you really want to speak, like example, if you want to communicate to the like game engine artist or programmer, then I need to self-taught myself to learn that software, learn Unreal Engine to study how to do the game, right? So, and there's no excuse to learn new software, like, because internet these days is so many resources. There's so many articles, there's so many tutorials, there's online course, so no excuse to learn new skill for me. And the best practice for me is actually one of the projects we have with Dyson is an augmented reality project. So this whole project is about, there's a multiple room experience that it will be kitchen, living room, dining room, and then when the audience walked in, you'll have an iPad that got introduced to and you'll be able to scan the AR code. And when you scan that, you start to see the toxin and bacteria and you got introduced at how each room actually have all this toxin and bacteria and how Dyson can solve all those problems. And the role that I got a job into this project is actually to pre-visualize the toxin and the bacteria. Ugly, beautiful, I would say. I would call that. Um, so the way that I work, I work from what I used to with, which is I use Maya to model it, Photoshop to texture it, and Cinema 4D to light it. Really beautiful. But the problem we have at work is, this app that we use to in this particular activation is actually built in Unreal. And for me to implement all those things that I make to in Unreal, it's like I have no clue how to do it. So I just, you know what? Go back to the basic and learn how to use Unreal Game Engine. So I learn how to just like learn the interface and also learn how to implement texture and also learn how to implement shading as well. And with that new software knowledge, I actually be able to use that as a bridge to what I already made in a pre-exist in the software I know in Photoshop and Cinema 40 and Maya into the game engine. And that's make my life so much easier to work with the programmer and game engine artists at work. And be it is great, be it a self-taught thing. But the next thing for me is do it. Another Star Wars reference, do it in a team. So by do it, in a team, for me, it's not only you learn about how to work with them, but you learn about them as well. So doing it for me, it's like, it's pretty similar how it's flashback for me again is when I learn how to speak second language. So when you try to learn second language, example, if you try to learn French, you can just literally mumbling the language and people will sort of have understand or be able to understand, that's one thing, right? But if you want to actually wholeheartedly understand Another person that you're talking with is the new achievement that you want to do in a language when you learn second language. So do it work. You not only want to just work, like be able to communicate to them, you want to understand them and where they're coming from. And the best one for me that I experienced this year is Game Jam. As Jack mentioned, is the events that people come together and make game for two days. And that is crazy, because that is from pre-production, production, and then show the game in two days, and that's so much pressure. And with all those, right, with all those process, people come across with so many skills, there's so much programmer, game artist, animator, or even illustrator. And we actually create a goal, uh, game, bleh, bleh, sorry. I'm Thai, I speak English, I will be fine. <laughs> So we made a game this year called Daybreak. And what is that game is about? It's about uh, there's a, a lamb that tried to survive in the post-apocalypse scenes. And in those process, what I learned is actually not only people be able to show their craft, but we be able to appreciate each other's craft, teach someone a new craft, and actually learn the new craft. And And with this, everyone can be creative. Like, for example, developer can come in and be creative role. Creative can come in and be animator. Animator can come in and just be programmer, you know? And with Game Jam, I treat it as like a pet project. Like, you actually fail together. You actually success together. You actually learn new skills and be able to understand to communicate to each other. 
And with all those things, even though you fail, you'll be able to use that and create a pipeline. And those pipelines will actually be able to use at work, which just means you will fail less when you actually work in the, during the day. And that's process and pipeline happen only two days, which is crazy. And the last thing for me is visualize it. And visualize it for me is probably the main key for me because actually in this slide, I'm actually BBA. I'm pretty excited about it. People. Um, so to visualize this is more important than another two that I mentioned before because visualize this is like a visual language. It's a universal language for everyone, not only the second person that you're talking with. It's for everyone's role in the team. And Imagine, go back to the basic, when I think about, when you mention, I have an idea, right? When you think about idea, it's not, never be a word or sentence in your head. When you have idea, it's normally a visual in your head. It's like .jpg, .png in your head. And when you try to explain it to the second person, it sometimes can be misinterpreted because people have a different reference point and different like ideas of what it is. And then when you explain it, it will never be the same visual sometimes. To explain it more, even more basic, even if I explain to you like, oh, create me the color of blue, like ocean blue. Some people can create a bit of aqua tint blue and some people can create like a really deep dark blue. So that's why visual become the main communication to make people to be in the same page. For me, one of the sample I think is the best for me as traveling around in Asia is actually in Japan. The, I actually can't speak Japanese, but the only three words I say is hi, arigato, and kawaii, and that's it, I can speak. But what the point is, I actually have no idea what Japanese language is, and then when I try to eat, but why I survive in Japan? Because of all these things, these glorious plastic fake food things. I'd be able to at least look at it and understand it and be able to communicate to the waitress, I want this thing, and I got a chance to eat awesome Japanese food. And what that display do is actually a main visual to solve the communication problem. And one of the sample I brought it today is actually the Adobe Remix project we done this year. And this is from the mural board that we done at work. Best website ever, mural board. And then what we done in here, as you can see, is like an arc thing, right? So what is this or this board do? It's actually a story arc of how we want to introduce the story into Adobe Remix. We start from scratch. We don't even think about what technology we want to use. We just think what story we want to represent. And we actually pretty obsessed with like AI and official intelligence and all those things. So we try to create a story of how creative and intelligence tool come together and create something better. So we build the team and start exploring the technology. And then we start to think of like, oh, maybe live performance, so it's more immersive. And then we try to scope it down. But what the problem we have with this project is more the fact that the technology is so broad. The particle is so many particles to be like to choose from. So how are we gonna scope it down? So we start to build a team of nine. <coughs> and how are we gonna make all of these nine people that have a different skill to be in the same page? So then that's why I start to create mood board and storyboards. As back from scratch, go back to sketch on, like sketch on a sketchbook and Photoshop's. And by, like, by that time, I actually have a chance to analyze the music and the movement of the dance choreographer in the video, and also the beat from the pianist that they already sample it. So from that, I go from how I can introduce all those beat and the movement of the dancer into the story that already exists. So as you can see at the top row, that's how I start to introduce the two line and the color together and how it come into the screen. And then it start to evolve and do it in the second row. And the last one is how to evolve into the logo. So I'm pretty happy with how I lay out the arc of the story and the technology together. But then that's when I start to have more fun with it when I think, hey, the dancer, when you actually sit on a seat like this and the dancer dances on the stage, all you see is actually from the front of the dancer. You actually not explore from a different angle. I'm at work so much, I actually see the dancer dance at office in every angle. And also by that time, Liam start to, Liam, which is technical artist in this project, he actually start to stimulate some particle and scope it down the shape that I think, hey, I can see potential of how that shape implement into the 3D space. So I start to create cinema uh, camera animatic into the cinema 4D. 
And that when I try to explore the mocap that we have before during a rehearsal and put with a little bit simple particle and how to navigate the physics of the particle into the scenes. And that become like a key point of how we can net picking of like, hey, I like this camera angle. I like this particle. I like how this tilt from the side to the top view of the dancer. So it's actually explore more 3D space of the performance instead of just being one dimension and look at it. And after we net picking and bounce back the idea with everyone in the team, then we, I actually finalized the camera and Liam be able to implement this camera and put an open GL framework. So yeah, that's, that's the five years experience for me compressed into how I communicate with the rest. And the reason why this is important because it's my three main communication, how I communicate with others. And it's, it's changed from how I have a dream job of just being animator, just to being in a role that I'm not even have a name of my role. I just do a lot of stuff. I just do awesome stuff and that's awesome. I'm not even have to label myself. And I'm lucky enough to have incredible team to, you know, be it, do it, visualize it with. And even though awesome stuff can come from individual mind, but even more awesome and greater stuff come from collaboration. So thank you and go team. <laughs>no one finds their way more into every room than Nikki. Um, when she started, we found out she likes to put herself in boxes to see if she's small enough. That's literally how she goes about her career, um, so, which is good. Um, so what's next is quite interesting because where Jack uh, once thought about going to clown school, Inga literally was a clown uh, for a while. So you may have seen her at such birthday parties as Dennis's fifth. Um, but. <laughs> Since then, some of her work, her thesis got her a scholarship to GDC last year. She's a founder and runs the community of Girls in Games, which is bringing girls um, and, and women and everyone who's interested in those views um, to kind of explore those in the community. Um, and she is going to talk about how she has gone from one of the oldest mediums uh, to one of the newest. So, welcome in, girl. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Inga, and I'm an artist working at S1T2. And I'm here today to talk to you about my story of being an artist, starting out in clay as a ceramicist, and then moving to digital 3D art and game development. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personality and who I am as an artist. So I've always been one of those kind of creative people who always has about 20 different projects on the go all at once, whether it be crocheting hats for every single person that I know or madly drawing crazy monsters in my sketchbook or something. Um, so that's one side of my personality. The other side of my personality is that I am absolutely incredibly passionate about cartoons and video games. So after I finished school, I united these two things and I decided that I would take this to art school. And at art school, I always thought by going to art school, I would become an illustrator or a concept artist or I would go into painting or drawing or something. And the amazing thing about art school is that it gets you to try a whole lot of different mediums. So I got to try printmaking and photography <laughs> and sculpture. And through trying all of these different mediums, I actually fell in love with clay. And funnily enough, I didn't fall in love with clay through the sculpture class, but I fell in love with clay through the ceramics class. And I was really drawn to the ceramic wheel. It was sort of this really incredibly meditative act that you could do. You could sit there and you could be completely immersed in what you were doing. And that was one side of it. The other side is that it was incredibly frustrating and you actually had to build up your skill level and become really good at it before you actually made anything that you would possibly want to eat or drink out of. So 
I am not going to talk to you about cups and bowls for this entire talk because I actually ended up moving into something that suited my personality and my interests a lot more, which was figurative sculpture. And this suited me a lot more because I have always been creating these characters my whole life. I have been exploring um, creatures and characters and their personalities and writing stories for them and creating worlds for them. And finding figurative sculpture as a medium was incredible because I was able to explore this in 3D and play with different mediums and create storylines for these characters. In tangent to me creating these characters, I was also writing a thesis on the art of video games and people who have used video games as an art form. I likened this to the romanticists of the 18th century. Sorry, getting a little bit conceptual here. But um, the, how the romanticists looked to nature and the intricacies of nature in awe or looked at the, the chaos of weather in terror and how they, how they perceived nature as this sublime moment. I liken this to um, the contemporary phenomena of the digital and people looking to technology in this same kind of awe-inspired feeling, but also at the same time in a feeling that kind of is a bit terrifying as well because we don't quite know its extents. And so this is one of my characters looking into the digital sublime. He's holding a Game Boy there that has a little, little moss garden growing out of it. I also really like moss. <laughs> um, so I decided, since I've been writing about computers and video games for so long, I should probably learn how to use a computer. And so I came up against the computer and how to computer. Oh my God, there are so many programs. And I didn't even really know how to plug in a hard drive, so I was really, really in the dark here. But I quickly overcame this because I realized that the programs are made to be incredibly intuitive and they're working, they're working with you. There's um, so many different incredible programs and you can just Google anything if you are confused as well. So if there's anyone who's scared about going into, into video game design or digital like 3D art, I would urge you to because it's actually really not that complicated. And this is coming from a ceramicist. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the interesting parallels that I found between working as a completely solo artist on my own practice to working and collaborating in teams with other digital artists and some of the platforms that I used that really enhanced my artistic practice personally. So the first thing that I found really interesting was reference gathering and organizing. And if you see my, this is a photo of one of my studios where I would kind of madly cut out things out of books and um, print off images and stick them all over my walls and then like a kind of crazy detective. But then I learned digital and how to gather reference on a digital platform and things like Pinterest and Mural and InDesign. And all of a sudden, collaborating with people, I learned how to organize all of, this, all of this material so that it was cohesive to a whole lot of people. And it was really beautiful how organically these processes kind of evolved when you're working in a kind of hive mind sort of mentality and learning and growing and figuring things out for the project together as a team. The next thing was learning Photoshop, which I'm not going to go too deeply into because I'm sure you all know and are very well versed in Photoshop. But the one thing that I found really hilarious about Photoshop was actually going back to my sketchbook and sitting down and drawing again and then having this, this sort of niggling in the back of my mind that I wanted to marquee select a part of my drawing and change it a little bit but then realizing that I was actually using my sketchbook and this isn't Harry Potter. So it really made me realize how much learning these digital tools has affected my art practice and made iterating upon ideas just so much more efficient and easy. When it really started getting interesting though was when I learned digital sculpting and modeling and I learned programs like Maya and ZBrush. A 
And in my physical clay practice, when I was creating these figures, I was constantly battling with the elements and with gravity. I was quite restricted to the forms that I would create. Some of my, I mean, most of my characters were often lying down or sitting because I physically couldn't make a standing character or with arms going out anywhere because it would break and it would not survive being fired in a kiln to a thousand degrees. And as well as that, clay is in this constant state of entropy. It is drying. So I was constantly battling with patching up cracks for when it got too dry. Or if it was a particularly hot day, it would dry even quicker. And if it dried at different rates as to other parts because of the thickness of the clay, it would probably crack as well. So there are so many things that I needed to keep in mind with the clay process. And then I tried digital sculpting. And all of a sudden, all of these restrictions just went away. And I was presented with the biggest blank canvas I have ever seen in my entire life. I was, the sky was the absolute limit. I could create all of these things that I had been thinking of in my mind this whole time. When I wanted my characters to do and be different things, all of a sudden I could just do it. A similar thing happened when I learned the texturing process to create the desired colors that I wanted in um, ceramics. Well, you actually just can't really get exactly the, the kind of colors that you want in ceramics because so many different things happen in the firing process where the temperatures actually change the colors that you put down. This um, white uh, character that I've got here actually did used to have color on it, but it wasn't until I'd gone through you know, an eight week process of painting and sculpting and glazing till it came out of its final glazing and it turned out completely white because all of the color actually just burnt off. So that's something that you just can't, you can't predict. But then I learned how to texture in digital. My characters all of a sudden could be exactly the color that I wanted. I could use the exact brush strokes that I wanted. If I didn't like it, I could just delete it and start again. And not only that, it's amazing for hand-painted textures, which is this character that, um, that I'm using from my example is um, just hand painted, kind of tried to make it look like it's a painting. But on the other side of that is that you can actually do completely realistic things. All of a sudden, if I wanted something to look like it was made out of metal, I could just click a button and use a slider. It's like I want it more metal or less metal. I want it to be yellow metal or blue metal. And I could make things look like velvet. I could make things look like cloth. I could make things look like anything that I could possibly want them to look like. So that was an incredibly liberating experience as an artist, is that I can literally make anything that I want right now, which was amazing. But when it got really incredibly exciting, which is what I always wanted my characters to do, was I wanted them to get up and move and have personalities. And I always had this idea in my mind with my sculptures that always just used to sit there I always had this kind of idea of them getting up and moving and what their facial expressions would be and what their voice would sound like and what their mannerisms would be. And now finally I was able to implement that within my sculptures. So this is Toku, this is the, the final work. That's her on her little mission. She's um, saving the last tree on Earth. And it was just an incredibly, it was actually quite a profound experience, finally seeing her getting up and walking. And as well as that, being able to put her into a game engine and being able to program, when I press spacebar, Toku jumps, which was just an incredible, incredible experience that not only is she on her own little journey, but she can also be experienced by other people on her journey. And they can go on that journey with her. So now, I'm working at S1T2. I've been here for about a year now. And my career has kind of shaped up to something that I really never thought it would look like. Joining the team at S1T2 has given me the chance to jump on a whole lot of different programs and try a whole lot of different tools and work on different projects. And it's been an incredible, incredible journey. This is one of the um, projects that we're working on, the moment, on at the moment. It is a virtual reality adventure game called Kept. And it is room scale virtual reality. So for those of you who don't know, room scale means that it's actually mapped to your room. So you can actually walk around inside the virtual world as if you are actually there. 
And this makes me think of the works that I made originally at art school with the character who was sitting immersed in their digital sublime. And I feel like I'm actually creating that digital sublime now in virtual reality for people to be able to walk around within and experience my forest that I have created to, I can use large open spaces to inspire awe or make little tiny moments that people can contemplate. And I find working on this platform incredibly rewarding, the video game platform. And I would really, I would really like you all to think about video games in a different kind of mindset as an artistic medium that is able to express so much more than the stigma of being like a first person shooter or something. It's actually an incredible platform for expression, to be able to tell stories and express morals and different things. So I'm in an interesting position right now because I have absolutely no idea where I'm going to go next. But it's really exciting being a part of this world. And thanks for listening. One of the unexpected benefits of, like, so we did, we did some sculpture stuff as well. And we only literally discovered this last week. Um, the whole benefits of working on interactive platforms and pipelines in real time. So normally what we do for a client or creative pitch, you draw a 2D sketch of what you wanted the sculpture to look like, and hey, it's going to look something like this, um, And like if, depending on the skill of your illustrator. Now with these real-time tools, what we'll do is you'll literally mock up a sculpture you know, in a couple of hours, and then you can go to the client, hey, put on a VR headset and come walk around the sculpture or check it out, and that's just like, it's hard to express how, help, how much that helps you in the sales process, because it's there, it's just virtual. Um, up next is self-proclaimed the best, uh, Liam Edwards. I have, Liam is also the self-proclaimed head of human resources at S1T2. Um, a long time, when you're starting out as a company and you're just trying to do, get work from anywhere and you're kind of becoming the, known as the guy, I apologize if this sounds like an S1T2 infomercial, sorry. It's like today, it's just the only experience we all have um, but to talk about. But you, people would be like, can you do this? And you'd have to say yes. And then you'd go back to your development team and say, hey, you're doing this. Or, and you hope it's been done before or they have some way of doing it before. And the only reason it never got done was for guys like Liam who can remain totally chill uh, the whole time. Like to the point where I think he turned up hungover in front of a stadium of 100,000 people um, when we had an active, when we were running an interactive game there, where you literally had the halftime window, so you've got about five minutes to go up, set up the equipment, run it, and then get back off. And Liam was just like, "Quasars in the way." But you just know, I, I'm never even worried because of um, the integrity Liam's got to actually always get the job done. So I'm very pleased to introduce you to Liam Stevens. Thanks for the welcome, Chris. Um, so I'm a creative technologist at S1T2, um, and that's basically a glorified way of saying my, I'm a programmer and a tinkerer who comes up with creative solutions to technical problems. Uh, I may look quite young, but I've been in the industry for around 10 years now, so I've seen my fair share of battles. And what I'd like to talk to you all about today is one of the biggest problems I think creatives face in our world, and that's the segmentation of creative role and creative thought. The noblest pleasure is the joy of understanding. Uh, this is a quote by Leonardo da Vinci, arguably one of history's smartest and most creative minds. He was a master of pretty much everything that he did, and most notably his work in arts and in science. This is probably one of my favorite quotes because it's taught me to want to learn something every day. Understanding comes through knowledge, and without understanding, we're missing out on what our jobs really have to offer. We're missing out on potential. So I haven't always known what I wanted to do with my career. I started making websites when I was eight, and I got a copy of Photoshop when I was 11. So I spent most of my teen years just kind of like messing around with the two. And I really developed this love for the connection between design and development. Uh, but Unfortunately, my industry experience has never really been as pleasant as that. So 10 years ago, and even today, uh, design and development are treated as two very separate worlds. And that's kind of reflected in the way that uh, projects are conceptualized, designed, and produced. 
I'd often curse the gods with frustration because of these small little design choices that offered little to no real value to an end product and ended up just wasting my time. So here's an example. Um, I just got this off Google, but it is a pretty shit website. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this kind of like illustrates some of the problems I used to face on a daily basis, which was like back in 2007 using custom fonts was like not possible. Um, it was like these shitty non-tileable patterns, static content, and, and just like rounded corners for the sake of it. So like, fighting these changes was always a huge nightmare. Like I was at the end of the supply chain, the designs already had clients sign off, and they needed to be delivered as is. So after a while of working in this industry, I kind of realized that developers are regarded as non-creatives. We're neglected from the design process because we would probably say no to anything a designer could say. Uh, so we had to be handheld through every design decision because if we had our way, the end product would probably look like shit. Um, I kind of think we were and still are being creatively oppressed. So I started to realize after a while that there was a much bigger underlying issue here. And I just couldn't quite figure out what it was. I was really frustrated. And I just got to this point where I needed some sort of closure. So I kind of I had this choice. I was going to either quit my job, change industry, like become a mechanic or something, or I would just focus on trying to figure out this problem. So I quit my job. And I moved down to Tasmania to study a Bachelor of Fine Arts majoring in graphic design. And my rationale was that if there was this big underlying issue I wasn't grasping, then I'd just stop doing development and I'd learn to become a designer from the ground up and hopefully knowledge from both of those worlds would help me understand the real problem. So my time at uni was awesome. I learned many new ways to express my creativity. Uh, I became a street artist and I got really into the theory of graphic design. Um, and I had the opportunity to study lots of different mediums to sort of express my creativity as well, which was like furniture design, film, drawing, printmaking. And my favorite was interactive media, where we got to actually make artworks using programming. So after a few years of studying, I kind of figured I'd learned as much as I needed to, and I just abandoned my degree, because I wanted to come back to Sydney and do programming again. Um, so after a while, I got a job at this small company in Bondi Junction called S1T2 as a junior web developer. I'd finally had an opportunity to start flexing my programming muscles with my newfound understanding of the design world. S1T2 was quite a small company five years ago. Um, there were seven, seven of us sitting side by side in a pretty tiny office. I could hear everything that was being said whether that's good or bad. Um, I always got to put my two cents into ideas that were being thrown around, even if they weren't really being thrown around. And I got to get really creative with helping out with, with pitches and briefs. So it was, it was really amazing to sort of express that conceptual creativity. However, after a few projects, I noticed that the pipeline for designs were kind of falling into the same traps as they were at my old job with designs getting signed off and passed to me before I even got to look at them. And because I was at the end of the supply chain again, I had no say. So I knew I had to nip this problem in the bud as soon as possible, because I'd spent so long trying to figure this out. And I was just really frustrated. Like, something had to change, because if it didn't, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> so this was my time to shine. Like, I actually had a chance to, to make some real change at S1T2. I had a chance to fix something that was so com commonplace and unnecessary. But I was super confused at how to do this. I mean, yeah, I quit my job and I went and studied for three years to try and figure it out, but it's just happened again. So yeah, I was, it, was just, it was super frustrating and I wasn't too sure. So what I did was I just chilled on it for a few months and I kind of really just wanted to like, get introspective and try and figure out how I could teach people or teach the team. So I decided that, yeah, I would, I would host lessons after work. And I would start to teach anyone who was interested in coming along my craft. And hopefully through sharing knowledge of my world, maybe the others could start to understand the problems that we're facing. So I started to teach some basic HTML and CSS, mainly focusing on the way that I approach uh, developing a design, 
which is kind of like ripping it apart and putting it back together again. It's the fundamentals of my job, really. Um, although I probably wasn't the best teacher, I really think that this knowledge helped our design team uh, because things really started to change after that. I wanted these lessons to be a case for me to be involved in the design phase, to be a paragon for developers around the world and finally have my say. But they didn't do that at all. They did something much more powerful. Our designers started to create amazing designs that were time efficient to develop, but were also incredibly fun to develop. With our spare time, we could finally start to focus on bigger problems like UX and customer journeys, and just kind of like making products better rather than getting bogged down in this aesthetic nightmare. Our designers were actually using the limitations of development to their benefit. And it wasn't because they downloaded some new Photoshop plugin or like some tool that revolutionized their industry. It's because they had something much more powerful. They had knowledge and they had understanding. So you might be sitting here saying, all right, cool job, Liam. You helped out your company. You got to make some cool shit because of it. But what's this got to do with me? Well, I can confidently say to all of you that you have or will face this issue in your career. Your problem might not be as obvious as mine, but the creative industry doesn't really encourage people to break outside of their traditional roles. Although it does encourage thinking outside of the box, you probably don't really know what's outside of that box. So by learning the fundamentals of your co-workers' industries, I guarantee that you'll be more creative than ever. You have a wealth of knowledge to draw upon. You'll be able to properly understand their roles, which will encourage better and more frequent collaboration. But most of all, you'll be able to, you'll have a better understanding of your role. The real problem is that why it's so easy for, for me to say this in theory, in practice, it's so much harder than that. We all work too hard. We have little to no free time to learn about something completely different when we could just be learning about being better at our current roles. Learning something other than what we know is a really slow, time-consuming process. It's difficult, and our jobs are already strenuous enough. If you agreed with what I just said, stop, because it's actually a bullshit fallacy. The truth is, it's not that hard. The knowledge you gain will make you better at your role. It will get you further in your career, and it will take a lot of stress off your team, but most importantly, off you. The only source of knowledge is experience. I really think this quote and the Da Vinci quote I gave earlier really resonate with each other. Because to gain understanding, we need to gain knowledge. And you can't gain knowledge without experience. You may have noticed that I introduced myself as a creative technologist and not a web developer. That's because I am no longer a web developer. Over the course of my time at S1T2, I've slowly transitioned my role from working on websites to working on lighting installations, games, and other experiential projects. It wasn't an overnight change. It was a long, long process of gradually learning my craft through experience, through practicing, and through learning. I've always had a strong belief that if you don't learn something every day, you're doing life wrong. We're sponges put on this earth to absorb as much knowledge as we possibly can. If I go home and I haven't done any work, I honestly don't feel that bad about it. Don't say anything. Um, but if I go home and I haven't learned something, I can't forgive myself. My way forward was to change what I'm focusing my learning on and sort of project that in a way that would help benefit my goals of fusing my love of art and my passion for coding. So I adjusted my working patterns to learn new skills that would eventually be formative of my current role. That kind of sounds like a bigger deal than it really was. So all I did was, whenever I attempted a project, I made sure that I spent 20% of time on that project using a new technology, a new way of thinking, or some new coding paradigm. And to be honest, that was kind of hard to do at first. I felt a bit like a fish out of water. But I didn't have a choice to back down because these were real projects that needed to get delivered to real clients. So the only thing I could do was learn to swim. And I think like, setting myself this real tangible expectation that I couldn't run away from was a real kick in the ass to actually make this change happen in my life. And I didn't always reach my 20% either. You need to set yourself these hard goals and just try and try and try again 
but be ready to fail. And failing's good. Like you should always be ready to fail and just keep rolling with the punches and keep getting back up. So a few months ago, I had the opportunity to lead a team of crazy people um, to remix the Adobe logo. We're going to create real-time visuals generated and manipulated from a pianist and a dancer using a MIDI keyboard and uh, this cool motion capture suit we found online. So we were the first Australians to be invited uh, to be invited to take part of this initiative, and some of the world's most talented artists and some of my favourite have taken part in it too. Uh, so it was pretty daunting to say the least. Here are some snippets from the show which we'll be performing. Um, we've probably shoved it down your throat enough today. But <laughs> so I got to choose what platform and technology we develop the, the whole projection in. Um, I had a choice between Open Frameworks, Unreal Engine, or Cinder. And I chose Open Frameworks just because that was something that I, I use on a regular basis. Um, and also, it's got this gigantic community that we could really draw some knowledge from if we're in a, in a hitch. However, all the visuals would have to be developed in OpenGL, which is a technology none of our team was familiar with. Uh, and I chose to use OpenGL because I knew it would give us much tighter control of the particle systems we were going to be using, and we could really add some juice into the way that they would move and be affected by the dancer's movements. I also really wanted to learn this technology because that's kind of where I'm projecting my role over the next few years. So it was pretty much my 20%. We were all way outside of our comfort zone. We had one month to remix the logo for the creative for one of the creative industry's most influential brands. Hell, one of our main tech artists didn't even know the programming language that we were using. Was I worried? Yep. Uh, but did that matter? Not at all. Because years, after years and years of throwing myself in the deep end, there's one thing I know how to do well, and that's swim. So the first step I took to try and figure out this problem was research. I scoured open source projects online. I, uh, just looking at what was possible, learning new techniques and, and getting new ideas for how the thing would look. And then the next thing I did was kind of put that research into practice and set up like a, a small base project that our team could then start using. So I got together some shitty particle systems that were you know, kind of average and hacked them together and I gave it to our team. And now we had a canvas to start creating. And I think that this was probably the biggest part of how we learned because we had a sandbox where we could just keep trying and failing ideas really quickly, and that's, that allowed us to iterate like, really quickly and, and come up with this, this kind of polished product at the end, and also gain knowledge along the way. So this is just a small example of how I try and innovate and learn with each project that I attempt. If you step just a little bit outside of your comfort zone all the time, you'll be on the right track to changing your horizons. You can have the power to bridge gaps between different roles in, our, in your team, work closer with people, and be a herald for change in this segmented industry. So I implore you to experiment, explore, tinker, and gain knowledge so that you can gain a better understanding of yourself and of your team. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. Um, we'll do some questions now, but I guess hopefully you've got some um, so I don't make them bring their chairs up for nothing. Um, but if there's a lesson out of all of this, I guess, is that you guys all create already. You know it's taken your entire careers to figure out what's good and what's not. That's the hard part of being a creative, and that's something you can't change overnight. But just learning a little bit of knowledge that you haven't done before to supplant, to actually add to that isn't the hardest thing in the world. So I guess that was the main thing we wanted you guys to take away, is just say, we're nothing special, but we can do it. If you guys are interested in doing it, please join us. And on that, as a shameless plug, we're actually hiring. Um, if, you, <laughs> if you know anyone who's look, if you know any kind of designers out there um, that'd be interested, uh, speak to Eve, who's running the, around with the camera somewhere. Um, he's in front of me. Um, so we have some Roby microphones, um, so if there's a anyone have any questions for these guys at all? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you have tried Medium yet and what you think of it, uh, Oculus Medium. 
I actually haven't had a go of medium lip yet. Um, sh yeah, shamefully, I haven't. I've had um, a go of tilt brush, which I thought was fantastic. But um, no, I actually haven't had a go of medium yet. Sorry, I, I can't comment. But no, I that's hear okay. it. Yeah, I'd say, I I'd say have a go. Um, but also that I think there's a long way before it gets to the point where you can create something as awesome as you can create in Maya in medium. Yeah. Uh, which, if people don't know, it's like... Uh, VR kind of sculpting, so you can basically sculpt in midair, and gravity isn't a problem, and you could make arms that don't fall off. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks. Cool. <laughs> Got one here. Uh, how do you see this applying to maybe other industries or? Uh, especially the game jam, so I don't, I work for a software company, um, but we are constantly faced with a challenge of where, um, how to share knowledge across different areas or different teams. How do you see game jam maybe working in a different area outside of gaming? Well, I think the, um, the core principles that make a game jam special is basically just running in there and, and pressure cooking, um, you know, and I think that, that can uh, um, kind of go across any kind of medium, but I guess it comes back to the difference between that hackathon and game jam kind of thing, where the game jam doesn't really have pressure to produce anything. Um, it's just kind of a place to explore. So if you can create that kind of environment, I see no way, I don't see any problem with it being used in any context um, at all. I mean, essentially what you're doing is putting people together and maybe just taking away their things that they like. Um, and making them get through it is the basic principle of a game jam, and it's sink or swim. So yeah, I think I think a really interesting thing about game jams as well is putting um, teams of different people that are kind of one person short of a role. So every everyone kind of has to collaborate together to fill that role, and they all kind of have to learn how to do that together. I've been thrown into the deep end on many game jams because we haven't had. Um, a sound designer at all. So all of us have had to come together and sometimes even record our own sound effects or like work together to figure out how to apply sound to video games. So that's also a technique that you can use. I think from an organizational level as well, we've struggled. Like it's easier when you're smaller and the bigger you get, it is harder to not get siloed. Um, and that is for the way we continue to cope with it is taking away the expectation of the role. So. For example, if there's creative briefs, developers are, are just as required to contribute as much as, um, you know, as a creative or an artist. And that is, yeah, sure, like, they're not going to, they, they might not come to the table with ideas all the time and things like that, but just opening that expectation, that opportunity. I think it's a subtle thing that has helped, and it does take a long time, like when you, we see people jump over into an organisation like that, but it's just the mental note that you're siloed and that's what you want to focus on is the hardest thing to break. Good things about Game Jam as well, since like this is my first time in Game Jam last time, is actually what interesting is working in industry, sometimes you have restriction of your creative, right? But what when you jumped into Game Jam, it's such an open brief, you actually can be so organic about your creative and you're just pulling each other's brain like crazy. There's a no limit of role, and that's when creative go beyond crazy, and then you sort of create something that you not expect it to be possible, really because you know, have no restriction, and that's what's good thing about it. Any other magic questions pop up? <laughs> uh, cool. cool. It's like whack-a-mole. Hi, guys. <laughs> so I was wondering, um, with emerging technologies, normally, usually we don't have the language to define what we're doing yet. And so I was wondering, um, in your experiences, when a client comes to you and sort of explains their vision, you have to make that jump in your head, okay, I, I, know, I, I understand that vision, and that's how I'm going to actualize it using those programs. Um, I was wondering, the other way around, when you create something and you talk about it, do you find that there's a difficulty in language and communication and getting others to completely understand mm -hmm. understand your vision? Do you find that you have to come up with the words and the linguistics for this yourself? Um, or what's your experience in this sort of I, I can area? say that, that uh, like we call what we're doing um, as part of the company real-time development. And this is like 
a very common term for everyone here, but I'm sure you guys ran into a situation where you say real-time development, someone doesn't really know what that is. And it's like, well, that's actually my entire job that you don't know what it is. So, I mean, that's really fun. Um, but, you know, you can explain it um, to, to people. You've just got to go through the process of offline banking, whatever. you just got to give people a lot of patience. I think one of the roles that we have um, pushing this kind of stuff is firstly, like, if you're trying to get a client and get them on board to, you know, um, get the money to make a job go through from a sales perspective, the first thing you need to do is consider yourself an educator with these kind of things. And it's our responsibility to educate um, with these new mediums so they can be um, picked up. And it's not easy, but... Uh, and, and as you say, I haven't got any advice in terms of how to do that, other than the, probably the most important thing about education is patience. Um. The biggest thing from my perspective, because I'm usually the one that's trying to get the work <laughs> of one of the guys, the team that are doing that, is um, it comes up in a f that problem comes up in many different ways. So the first one is the client will come to you and say, they've seen something before and they want that, and that's how they know, because they don't have the language or the affinity to take it to the next level, they come to you and say, I want this. And then you have to, your job is then to say, no, you don't want this, you want the success of this or what this did and then take them along the line. Um, the other part is you have to have that common ground to debate first. So for us, that's where the company name comes in, story first, technology second. It's like, all right, let's agree on the concept and story. Don't come to it with any preconceived technological solutions because then that's how you can justify how you're building the tech around that concept. And you generally have to do that with metaphors and references. Like, OK, so this is this part of the tech. So we're interacting with this, just like you'll play with the Kinect. And then the game mechanic's going to be somewhat like Mario Kart or something they can latch onto. <laughs> so you've kind of got, even though your job is to think 10 steps ahead, you're no good if you can't communicate it back to the client. And, for, and that's why the client's are actually the best um, devil's advocate, because you've, what, we can get lost in a bubble where we think everything is self-explanatory and you put it in public and then um, you know they don't get it. The exciting thing about what we're doing here is human-computer interaction and making that interaction with computers really easy. So if you can get them to, if you won the battle in the room already, then you can kind of go okay with that. Did you have something? Okay, sorry. You literally just say it, so all good. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, oh. <laughs> this is like a game. Sorry, I can't shout loud enough. In your um, team uh, structure on projects, what's um, f for all each of you? Like, what's what's the big challenge that you find? Because each project has a different kind of outcome and different makeup of skill sets, right? Um, what do you guys find as the biggest challenge in in project processes, like working together or like the team makeup or, or skill sets and that? I think I honestly think one of the biggest challenges is trying to get everyone to be on the same page quickly so that we can start to iterate on projects and like actually make something good. Um, like just that sort of cohesion at the start of a project is really hard to get across everyone that's working in it. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what I think is one of the hardest things. Yeah, that's why when we have meeting on the pre-production. Like, when we have pre-production, it's like we normally put energy into it really crazy. Like, we will make mural board, we'll make storyboard, we'll make animatic, we'll make, like, character design, we'll do a reference of character, right? So, the more we do, our mural board is crazy. If you see it work, it's like 20 of them just for one project. And it's just because people can see, not only we create a final mood board, we have, like, the arc, how it start how it evolve and how it become at the end. The reason why we keep all those, so people can see that what is in your head, like what's the reference point, why are you picking all this point of idea and why this character design. So reference and mood board is very important. Like that's become like a major thing that Inga and me do in the office really. It's just like a lot of photo and yeah. And that's like put everyone in the same page. It's, like a big thing, because when everyone click in the same vision, that's when the workflow is so much easier, because everyone will start to have ideas like, hey, to complete that, we can use this code, or to complete that, we can use this technique of art. So that's become like just a big reference point. I think one way we cheat around it is, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, sorry. No. Uh, 
Yeah, something, something that I found um, quite complicated is working on the same projects as other people and really making sure that your pipeline is very, very clean in terms of like naming conventions and actually just the projects themselves that if you're using a, like Photoshop layers or something that they are all very neat and clean if you're gonna then hand them over to an animator, they need to be completely understandable as well. So just kind of being across a lot of different programs and their basic ins and outs if they're being used on a project, you should all kind of have an idea of what everybody's specific roles within that team are, what software they're using, and just to make sure if you have any kinds of crossovers that you're, you're across what, what that is and what you're needed for. Especially in, um, in game design, it's been really interesting collaborating with programmers. As an artist, um, we both use the game engine together collaboratively. And I've needed to learn um, bits and pieces of uh, visual coding as well. So when I put in my um, sculptures and my assets into a, um, into a game, it's easily found by the programmer and um, I have kind of taken my artwork to, to the level and to the, like, the creative vision that I am possible to so that the programmer can then say, oh, I can see what they're doing there and now I can take it and help you out with the rest of it. I wanted to add to that. To be honest, it still often can end in a total clusterfuck. I don't know if there is like a good way with every project being different. You've just got to learn to live on your feet. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have found that in the environment. What, I, what, what I'm looking at now as a different way of experimenting, of trying to make this right, uh, and you know, um, I think it's interesting, like I was just at uh, the last GDC and I, I spoke to a lot of art director, I saw a lot of art director talks. Everyone's talking about their methodology of trying to set it right, but also admitting that there is kind of no way. Um, what we're trying now with our projects, and this kind of works because they're generally scoped at around two months, three months, is going completely broad first and building all the features um, without any kind of polish, um, and then building them all up at the same time. Or if you get passionate about something and just have to work on it more, do that and, and explore that and whatever. But by going really wide first and not working necessarily chronologically. People can see that product and how it's gonna be and then add value where value is gonna be added and so it's more of a um, uh, collaboration there because everyone can kind of see that structure. Yeah. That works, kinda. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest conflict is easily usually the age old one is like whoever had the artistic vision and then having to cut that along the development process and that frustration of like, why won't this look like I wanted it to look like um, can usually ha happen. I guess that's just something we're used to. We always try and, un it was, it's really easy to oversell these kind of concepts. Like when it's emerging tech, you can try and sell the moon, but I think you're doing yourself a disservice and the industry a disservice. I think it's always better to under promise and then they just get really amazed. Like for example, and you can't always do this, why you get away with it in emerging technology is because you can't show like this full on finished render of what it's gonna be like. So we did a job for Disney, they thought they were gonna get a 2D experience and it ended up being an interactive 3D experience and they were like, holy crap, that's amazing. But um, it's because we kind of, because we can play in that R&D space, we can lower the bar a little bit to try and exceed that. Um, Cause you, when you're always doing R&D, yeah, you're confident you're gonna get there, but you're not a thousand, you don't wanna, yeah, overcommit, I guess. Am I gonna say that's it again? Or is any more questions? <laughs> oh, it's such a good one. Um, what was the project that you guys did with Disney? Oh, okay. Um, did, so the project for Disney was uh, for Disney Shanghai. Um, so it has actually been, there's many super Disney fans at, at um, S1T2 and it was kind of like, wow, bucket list project ticked. It's not the real bucket list project we want. We will, like the ideal thing would be to do something in Disneyland. This was in uh, Shanghai Airport to advertise for Disneyland. So the idea was we built um, an interactive experience where you could uh, basically, you know the, cast, the famous castle scene where the castle lets fireworks at the end of the night? So you would interact and explode those fireworks as you hit them and then do the whole, like, this thing which kind of animated out, which was really cool. But I mean, like, for us, we were like, we got the castle asset to um, work with, and we're like, wow, we're getting the castle. Worst nightmare ever for Inga. <laughs> and to be honest, the big, and we all know this, the biggest issue is usually client assets and what they give you in these 
in these type of projects. So it's, that's an industry problem that needs to get solved out. But yeah, that was, uh, it was a cool project. Um, and that's the cool thing is a lot of this stuff we get to do ends up being working out with like you're aiming at kids or trying to get adults to act like kids. One of our design philosophies with human-computer interaction is you're not actually designing for the person playing the game, you're designing for the people that are watching the person play the game. So the minute you get off in the airport and someone's doing this, everyone's like, whoa, what's that? And they come around. So it gives us cool ways to play with that. So. Thanks, guys. <laughs>